Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. This is Rocket Science, and today we will take a look at the newly revealed Raptor 3 and an orbital space company called Sidereus out of Italy that is already building a single stage to orbit rocket system. Flight directors go for push. Elon Musk recently released this image of the Raptor 3. And of course, everyone is impressed with its simplicity when compared to the earlier versions. Raptor 1 is what we call a Frankenstein prototype. Get it to work no matter how ugly it is. Raptor 2 was more refined, simplifying connections and reducing components when possible. Raptor 3 shows a near finished product. There will be tweaks here and there, like removing the redundant oxygen sensor that broke on a Falcon 9 rocket engine after a hard start when the second stage vacuum Merlin ignited. The cracked line to the sensor caused an oxidizer leak that cost SpaceX quite a few of its own satellites and grounded the entire system for a few weeks. Musk always says the best part is no part, and removing the sensor and line solves this problem completely, as its information was redundant. We looked at the capabilities of Raptor 3 in this lesson, but today let's review the main components. This is the oxygen intake. All the oxygen will come in here, first encountering an inducer, and then the pump part of the turbo pump. Since the Raptor engines use full flow stage combustion cycle, explained in this lesson, all of the liquid oxygen passes through the preburner here, where a little methane fuel is brought over and burned in the oxygen rich environment powering the turbine part of the turbo pump. So the alloys here will need to be some form of inconel, which is a nickel cobalt alloy that can withstand the high temperature oxygen produced. Most metals, even titanium, burn quickly under these conditions. Now we have hot oxygen coming down through here into the combustion chamber. At the same time, liquid methane is brought down here, encountering its own inducer and pump. But here you see that the flow of cryogenic methane is redirected by the pump through this pipe to here. This is the intake of the cooling shroud that covers the hafnium carbide nozzle. The cold methane flashes from liquid to gas, absorbing the heat that would otherwise destroy the nozzle. The hot gas is then fed into the combustion chamber and ignited to start the rocket engine. The spin-up to start the turbo pumps is provided by high-pressure gas nitrogen in some systems, but helium works better. The Starship Super Heavy booster carries up enough helium to restart these inner 13 engines, while the outer 20 cannot restart. Having been spun up on the launch pad by these retractable disconnects, the Starship can restart all of its engines, and here's a beautiful view of all six of them being hot-fired recently. Back on the engine, there will be a feed line to bring oxygen to the methane preburner, and there will be a line to feed methane to the oxygen preburner. As you can see, just like the GigaPress allowed Tesla Motors to reduce the number of parts in its cars, 3D printed high strength alloys allow SpaceX to reduce the number of parts in its rocket engines. This is the true difference between SpaceX and every other rocket company on Earth, including Blue Origin. SpaceX product is not the rocket engine. It is the system that makes the rocket engine. Efficiently, fast, and cost-effectively. A Raptor engine costing less than a million dollars can be compared to the RS-25 engines on the SLS which cost over 100 million dollars each and are then thrown away. Low cost combined with reusability and the capacity to make thousands of these is the only way that humanity will have a shot at the rest of the solar system. This is SpaceX's true advantage and why it dominates the space industry today. But there will always be room for other players. Not everyone needs to send 100,000 kilograms to space. In fact, what if you only want to send up around 13 kilograms? The simplest system for that would be a small single stage to orbit reusable rocket. And that's just what Sidereus has designed. The basic concept seems to be an RP-1 and liquid oxygen powered single stage. What kind of performance can they expect from their engines? 
and how much starting mass will they need to get 13 kilograms to low Earth orbit. The design uses nozzle engines, assumably efficient at sea level, in a kind of aerospike configuration around the heat shield for higher efficiency at altitude. If we assume that they will get the same efficiency as a Falcon 9, a big assumption, we'd be looking at about 280 seconds specific impulse at launch and around 340 seconds at higher altitude. Let's average that to 330 seconds since the air gets thin above 10 kilometers and see what we get. Here we see a problem. We know what the payload is, but the final mass will be the payload plus the dry mass. But what is the dry mass? These are balloon tanks and small rocket engines with small turbo pumps. Let's see if we can work backwards. We take the specific impulse of 330 seconds and multiply by 9.81 meters per second squared to get an exhaust velocity of 3,237 meters per second. To get 13 kilograms to low Earth orbit, ignoring dry mass and assuming 9,400 meters per second of delta V to end up in a low Earth orbit at 7,800 meters per second, with gravity and atmospheric drag losses, would require starting with 237 kilograms of propellant. Now liquid oxygen is 1,250 kilograms per cubic meter, and RP-1 is about 840 kilograms per cubic meter, if cooled sufficiently. And the oxidizer to fuel ratio for RP-1 fueled engines is about 2.7. So for every 2.7 kilograms of oxygen, we need 1 kilogram of RP-1, giving us 73% liquid oxygen and 27% RP-1 by mass. So about 173 kilograms of liquid oxygen and 64 of RP-1. One cubic meter of these propellants would be more than enough. That wouldn't be much at all. But we've ignored the mass of the engines and tanks. If we assume a 100 kilogram dry mass, meaning we'll end up with 113 kilograms in orbit at burnout, and remember they would still need propellant to deorbit, or they would need a propulsion stage on their 13 kilogram satellite, either of which adds mass. And just going with 113 bumps us up to a starting mass of 2,061 kilograms, so over 2 metric tons. That's a big difference. That would mean about 1,504 kilograms of liquid oxygen and 557 of RP-1. If we divide those by the densities, we see that we need 1.2 cubic meters of oxygen and 0.66 cubic meters of RP-1, so 1.86 cubic meters total. Since the rocket is supposed to be 3.5 meters tall, tapering from perhaps one meter at the base, this should not be a problem. My question is this. These are supposed to be reusable up to a dozen times. How will they do that without cryogenic cooling? Will they take up extra liquid oxygen to try to cool the base? Or will it be ablative and the low mass to area ratio keep it from getting too hot? And why didn't they use liquid methane or even propane? If they used liquid methane, since they have to deal with cryogenic oxygen anyway, Assuming an overall engine efficiency of now 370 seconds, your gross mass would only be 1.5 metric tons, and your total volume would be less than 1.62 cubic meters. Either way, this is an interesting concept. A single stage to orbit is not efficient on Earth, with chemical engines and a high mass payload. But perhaps a single mission low mass to orbit design could work. Something to think about. Let me know what you think, and stay safe at Astra Proterra. Well, currently we are living in an historical moment that will be remembered in the next centuries, the moment in which humankind is going to be expanding across space 
And currently we are still facing one of the biggest hurdles of space travel, which is getting to space in the first place. So with Sidereus Space Dynamics, we are creating new generation space launch vehicles capable of delivering payload into low Earth orbit and coming back in a fully reusable manner. Those vehicles are miniaturized. We call them uh, the personal computer of launch vehicles because just like personal computer, their goal is to spread the space travels instead of computing power to hold humankind in a more democratic manner.